We're filming today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive at Hamilton College, and I'm very pleased to have a second conversation with Joe Wilder. Welcome. Thank you. You uh, saw some great photo opportunities already this morning. Oh, do we have a couple of good know, ones, I hope, <laughs> anyway. It's quite a passion of yours. Have it you is, been, actually. Yeah. You've been doing it for a lot of years? I, well, I started doing it when I, as a hobby, actually, when I was in the Marine Corps. That's a long time ago, 1944. And, uh, and I've sort of stuck with it since then. It's, it's interesting. It gives yeah. you a chance to be a little creative. And I know that you like to send photos back to people that... You yeah, know. I do that because usually you have no way of expressing your appreciation to the people you've worked for or the people you've been associated mm -hmm. with. And it gives you a chance to give something back to them. I mean, uh, a lot of people are very wealthy. I'm not wealthy enough to match that. And so the people seem to appreciate photographs and things like that. And, and a lot of times uh, I make a point of trying to take pictures of, of people with their families uh, in situations where maybe ordinarily they wouldn't get a picture of the family. And it's, it's something that they can recall that particular period of their lives, and it's nice for them. The first time we talked, we were down in Sarasota. Right. We were playing a, a jazz festival, and we didn't get to a couple things that I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about today, mm -hmm. if we could. And you mentioned the Marines. Right. That uh, you were drafted. Yes. And what year was that? Uh, 1943. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there, uh, did you feel that you were going to be sent overseas at that point? Uh, that's one of the reasons I went into the Marine Corps. I had a choice of going into uh, the Army, the Navy, or the Marine Corps, which had just begun to recruit uh, black Marines. Mm -hmm. This was the first time. I was not in the initial group, but uh, the platoon that I was in brought the number of black Marines to 1,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I was given a choice. Would, would you, would you want to go in the Army, Navy, or the Marine Corps? And they said they're not accepting any more non-combatants, you know. And uh, uh, so uh, to go into the music uh, thing, there was no possibility at that time in either of them. That, at least that's what I was told. So I said, well, if it's going to be a combat thing, I might as well go into the Marine Corps mm -hmm. where they're supposed to train people for that. And that, that's where I went. Yeah. yeah. But you did get to uh, play in the band. I did, uh, eventually. I was in a, a, a unit that was being trained for small weapons. Uh, unit and uh, Bobby Troop, who was who was a lieutenant at that time, he knew that I was a musician, and he finally said that it's uh, you know you might as well put, add him to the band. And uh, I was transferred after after boot camp to the band, and uh, later on I became an assistant, became the assistant bandmaster of the mm -hmm. band. There, you have to play for marches and. Uh Assemblies and all that kind all of thing. those things and and uh, for instance we'd go to we played a, one one thing I remember very well we were playing for a general who was, who was his name was Chesty Puller he was one of the most famous of the marine generals and he was giving um, a medal of honor I think to some some marine who had earned that and we played for that ceremony and I remember I remember that and and there are certain procedures you go through when you go up and salute the general and he throws a salute back. And, and when, when I, I executed all these things that I was supposed to do, and I heard him say, that's my kind of Marine, or oh. something, it was a real compliment. You know? Nice. <laughs> Did you play um, dance music also for oh, yes. the Oh, we had a dance bass? orchestra, we had a dance band. And we played at the officers club on weekends, and we played sometimes at the USO. And that's basically what, what they did with the dance band. Right. Mm -hmm. Was there a period of adjustment or any unpleasantness in the fact that the Marines had just become integrated? Yeah, it was, it was rough. In the beginning, it was, it was a, pretty, a pretty rough situation because uh, there were no black officers and there were only a few uh, black non-commissioned officers, corporals and, and uh, maybe a couple buck sergeants, but that came later, actually. So that uh, all the uh, personnel with any authority were white, all, all the personnel. And of course, we were in the middle of the South, so conditions were based on the, on the racial problems that we had you know, prob uh, prior to that. And of course, in the military, it was, it was a lot more severe. You had told me about an incident with one of the bands you were with in the South, I think it was South Carolina. Uh, oh, oh, Lucky Mulliner. Yes, yeah. and it was the first 
time you'd been down there with a yeah we we band. we were in South Carolina and Lucky Millinder, Lucky was a very nice nice fellow. He was not a musician, but he he had a lot of natural talent for selecting the right kinds of tunes and tempos and things of that nature. But uh, we had, I think, six of the members of the band were white. And uh, when, we, when we went, to, we arrived early in South Carolina at this hall where we were going to play, and suddenly up drove the, the sheriff with his deputy in the police car, and he said, who's in charge here? And so Lucky said, I am. He said, well, I'm just here to tell you there it's not going to be any mixed bands, any mixed bands playing down here in Charleston. And, and Lucky looked at this guy. Lucky, another reason I think they call him Lucky, he, he would take a chance on anything. He looked this guy dead in the eye and said, this is not a mixed band. And, and some of the guys are blonde with blue eyes and all this. There's no way in the world anybody would have mistaken any of these guys for being black, you know. And so he went, he went to each guy. I think if he had said, uh, are you are you black, they might have, he might have gotten a different answer. But he went to each of these guys and asked him, said, are you colored? And each of the guys going along with what Lucky had said, said would say yes. You know? and, and he sort of shake his head. And he got finally the last uh, of the guys he asked was uh, Porky Cohen, who was our first trombone player. And he had a slight lisp. And when he asked him, now Porky is, is, is responding more emphatically than the other guys, and he said, why, certainly, <laughs> with this list. And at this point, we had all been standing there chewing on our tongues yeah. and everything trying not to break up because it was so ludicrous. And when, Chuck, when he did this, you could almost feel the ground tremble with the guys laughing, with the, trying not to let the sheriff see them. But anyway, he turned to the deputy and he said, well, I guess if they all say they're colored, there ain't nothing we can do about it, is it, Jeff? And so he said, no, sheriff. And they got in the car and they drove off. And we played that dance that night. That's it was very funny. And it might, as I mentioned to you, it might have been the first time that an integrated band played there. It's, mm -hmm. it's very possible that that was the first time. Do you think Lucky was anticipating any problems going down there? But he just said, well, we're going to do it well, anyway. Well, Lucky knew that there were some problems, but he was a guy that it, it just didn't matter to him. Mm -hmm. It didn't make any difference. Once he got there, he would try to take care of whatever came up, you know. And he was fortunate that usually he handled it very well. And this was before or after the Marines? Uh, this was after. Oh, this was after so this the Marines. Was late 40s. It was 1948. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. You've been on the kind of forefront of, of a number of times of, of integrating things in the studios in New York, too. Right, right. Yeah. right. right. So when I, I was with Jimmy Lunsford at the time of his death. And uh, when I came back, I came back to New York and uh, I went back to Philadelphia, actually. And I stayed there for just a short time, then I joined uh, Herbie Fields' band. And uh, he had had an integrated band, I mean, on several occasions. It was a small group. But Frank Rossellino was in the band when I was there. And uh, <clears throat> Rudy Cafaro was playing guitar. Joe Gatto was playing piano. And we had really a nice, a nice group. Uh, then, after I left that band, I went with Sam Donahue, and I was the only black musician in that band at that time. It was a nice band, nice mm -hmm. bunch of fellows. I wanted to ask you again, I brought it up the last time, mm -hmm. but in, in watching you operate, and you've been here for a few days on the campus, and you seem to have a very well-formed work ethic, as I'm going to call it. Um, and you had told me about a, a few things that you believe are right in, in the way you operate your business mm -hmm. and deal with other people. And I'm wondering, where did you get this work ethic? Was it something from your family, or is it just inherent I, in you? I guess I got it mainly from my father, who, who was a musician. And uh, my father played with a lot of the, the bands in Philadelphia. And he, he was a stickler for being on time. He used to pound that into my brothers and me that, you know, it's better for you to come one hour early than to come one second late for something. And he would use as an example, there was a drummer that played with one of the bands he played with. And the guy was a good drummer. And he said, you know, the dance starts at 8 o'clock and we're all there. He said, we're all sitting on the bandstand ready to play and the drummer isn't there. He comes at 8.15. He said, and he knows it takes him at least 20 minutes to set up his drums. He said, now what sense does that make? He said, what excuse is that? And then he would say, you know, just because you're black doesn't mean you have to show up late. And they, they had a, an expression 
that they, they used to use. Uh, they would say, there's a, you, have, you go, to, go to work and you come on time, and then there's another time that they called CP time, colored people's time, you know. And CPT, they used to, was, it was a thing they used to use with the blacks, use it in reference to, to the other, other people who came late, you see. And they would say, well, there's, a, there's such a thing as the correct time and, and CPT, colored people's time. You know? And so this was a real put down, so you didn't want to get involved with that. But that's basically where I guess I got it from, my father. And, uh, and the other, the other idea, the, the deportment of the guys on the job and things like that, mm -hmm. felt that they had an obligation to come on time, perform properly, to dress properly, and, and conduct themselves in a way that people wouldn't have any problems with them, you know. I'd never heard that expression. It's <laughs> yeah, it's an old, it's yeah. an old expression. And, yeah. and a, a lot of the Latino musicians have this, an expression that's similar, too. Yeah. The Latino musicians, uh, one fellow was a friend of mine, and he was working. He was one of the first Latin musicians to play in the Broadway theaters. And we were doing uh, Lorelei with Carol Channing. And one, <laughs> a couple times he showed up. The show hits at 2 o'clock, and at 2.30 he came in. And he couldn't walk through the band. He had to crawl on his, because of the way we were all, all set up, he had to crawl through the orchestra to get to his seat. And he was so accustomed to showing up late when, when he played a, a Latin dance or someplace in some hall. If you got there a half hour late, as long as you got there, it was OK. Mm. So they had to explain to him that this is not <laughs> A Latin dance hall. This is a Broadway theater. I've I've wondered that because I worked with a, a couple Latin musicians mm -hmm. who had the same kind of attitude, and oh, I yeah. wonder if it was a cultural that they're much just basically re, more relaxed right, people right. in their daily lives. That's basically lives. what it is. It's it, it's it's nothing it has nothing to do with the character. It's just that that's the way things go. You know, yeah. the party starts at two. It's going to go until ten anyway. So when right. you get there at some time in between, it's okay. Thank goodness. We talked a bit about uh, ABC, mm -hmm. and uh, those must have been pretty busy days for you. They were. They, were, they were pretty busy days for almost all of the musicians in New York. That, that whole thing with the orchestras, um, what was the, the era that that ran from? I would think that, well, I guess it went from about the late 30s. Through the uh, through the 70s, because mm. mm -hmm. I think it was 75 when we stopped doing the Dick Cavett show, and, and at that point they had begun to get rid of the staff orchestras at, at all the networks. Yeah, they had some fairly well-known classical people head up those orchestras, didn't they? Right. Well, at NBC they had Toscanini, uh, at CBS, um, I, I, Paul Laval had. The City Services uh, Concert Band, and at ABC they had, uh, very often we had Arthur Fiedler, and we had other, because they did, they did the Metropolitan Opera Editions of the Air, and they did um, music for Summer Night and Voice of Firestone, mm -hmm. and they would very often have guest conductors come in for those things. Was most of the music you recorded in those orchestra situations, was it going on tape for use later, or was it live? No, it was live. Almost all of it was live, and a lot of it they recorded. And <clears throat> when they finally got rid of the staffs, all this, these tapes and things they had, they just threw them in the garbage. I mean, a lot of it just went in the trash. And there were a couple fellows who were involved with uh, ABC, with, with the library there, who, who had the good sense to take some of this stuff, knowing that they were just going to throw it out. And, uh, they, they were, out, were able to save some of it, but the, the, the bulk of it was just thrown out. And some of the, the libraries that they had, I think they gave some of it to Columbia University or Princeton or something. Some of it was given to one of the colleges. But uh, most of it they just threw out because it was in the way. Mm -hmm. Your, um, I'm going to return to your work ethic again, must have served you pretty well in this situation mm -hmm. because obviously had to be, there's no, there's no crawling, no, 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 no. You, 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 <laughs> you, you did these things, it was a matter of, of just routine. And all, everybody complied. It was, it was not, there was nothing servile about it. It was just that this is the job you do, and, this, and these are the, the, the requirements for doing it. Mm -hmm. When was the um, first opportunity to get with a major label of your own, under your own name? 
that was when I did a, a, an album called The Pretty Sound for Columbia. Mm -hmm. And Nat Shapiro, that's what I couldn't think of Nat's name. Yeah. He's the one who, who, was, who promoted me for that, for that, that record and the, the Peter Gunn. Uh, he was responsible for that. Mm -hmm. But that was the first time. I did some things for uh, Savoy, but, but nothing, uh, in, as far as I'm concerned, of the quality of the Columbia things. Well, I noticed in looking, this was recorded... It says January 18th, 1959. Mm -hmm. So you had one day to do 10 songs. We did the whole thing in one session. That's yeah. right. Wow. In, well, we were two, it's probably two sessions involved, but it was the same day. Right. They right. do uh, three-hour sessions. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I've been hearing from right. other, right. other folks. Oh, yeah. And uh, you, they'd like you to avoid the overtime, don't they? Oh, did they ever? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, you said you hadn't read these liner notes, and I, no, I, haven't. I, I just wanted to... I could read anything now, and you wouldn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> says, Joe Wilder's blessed with impeccable taste, penetrating intelligence, and the most beautiful horn tone since the great Joe Smith blew his heavenly sounds in Fletcher Henderson's band. Well, that's a nice compliment. Isn't that nice? <laughs> British critic said he's one of the very few completely fresh and original trumpet stylists to emerge with modern jazz. Oh. It's a very Not nice, bad. <laughs> it's a nice so, statement. So I'm out today to find out the secret of Joe Wilder's tone <laughs> so I can sell the information. <laughs> uh, you know, I studied with a teacher. I had a very fine teacher in the beginning. I had a couple teachers prior to him. Uh, they were friends of my father's. And um, one, um, what's his name? Chauncey Welsh was a saxophone player with Cab Calloway's brother. And, and, not Chauncey Welsh, Chauncey Horton. And his, he had a brother, Cliff Horton, who was mm -hmm. a very good trumpet player. And he, was, he lived in Baltimore, but uh, he, he used to come to Philadelphia. And I studied with him uh, for a while, only, only a short time. And then uh, my father decided that I should study with a man named Fred Griffin, who was a cornet soloist. He played these same kinds of solos as Del Stegers and Herbert Clark and these people. And I studied with him, and he was a, a stickler for the sound of the instrument. You had to get a big sound on the instrument. He, he stressed that and technique. And he had taught my father. My father played sousaphone and played cornet in the beginning, and he studied with Mr. Griffin. And then he switched to, to sousaphone, and Griffin taught piano, trumpet, trombone, and almost all the, the brass instruments. And so I, I studied with him, and he was one of these teachers where then when you'd play out of the Arbin book that we were using, and he knew this thing inside out, and you'd he'd say, okay, and he'd tell you what exercise to play, and you'd play it, and you'd, he'd say, that's not a C, that was an E flat or something, <laughs> and, he, and he'd find it, that's what the note is, and he'd, and I, he'd, he'd literally beat it into me, you know, <laughs> but that's where it comes from. <laughs> He got some discipline out of that, yeah. I would imagine. He, he, was, he was a tremendous player, though, because at uh, one of the radio stations, I think it was WPEN or WCAU, I'm not sure which it was, but at any rate, they would have a, a, a period during which they had no scheduling of any commercial thing or something like this, and they, and they just had a time slot that they had nothing to fill it, fill it in with. And they would call him, and he had a, uh, there was a pianist named Frank, Franklin Hoxter, and he was a concert pianist, and he would accompany Fred Griffin on these cornet solos, and the network would call and say, we need you for an hour or a half hour to play cornet solos to fill in this spot, and that's what he did. He's a very fine player. That's interesting. Those, those days are, are pretty much gone of there, someone yeah. coming in and playing live you know, right, for an hour. Right, and, right. Uh, I wanted to ask you about... Um, when you were with the big band, a couple big bands before the Marines, mm -hmm. and then after again, did you have, can you recall if you had a, a goal, an eventual goal for your music career at that point? I, you know, I was, I was so thrilled in a way and surprised too that I ended up, for instance, in uh, Les Heights' band. Uh, 
of course, I was 19 years old, and this was quite an, exper an experience for me. And I remember when I left Philadelphia on a bus to go to Lansing, Michigan, to join Les Heights Band, and my mother accompanied me to the bus terminal. And I can remember my mother standing, as we had the window down, and the bus is loaded with people. And my mother saying, don't you do anything to embarrass this family while you're away. And I would say, OK, mother. <laughs> But I remember that, that moment when I was leaving Philly. But I was rather surprised, and I was more—I was actually in awe of most of the fellows who were in the, in those bands. They were a little older than me. Some of them were in my age group, but a lot of them were older and had a lot more experience. Yeah. So I felt kind of lucky to be there. And uh, when I left Les Height, I joined the Lionel Hampton band, which at that time was roaring, and and I was really in awe of that band. I mean, I, again quite happy that I became a member, but uh, it, it's strange because the first trumpet player was um, Carl George, and he, he was having, he was going, getting a divorce or something, and he had to go to St. Louis uh, for this uh, legal thing, and they needed someone to come in and play just during the period that he was away, and so and somebody recommended me, and I left Les Heights Band and joined that band, and uh, while, while we were there, it was Ernie Royal, Joe Newman and I were the trumpets. And then when Carl came back, they decided to, to keep four trumpets. And that's how I remained with the band. Mm -hmm. So I stayed with them until I went into the service. It wasn't the easiest gig in the world. No, from it wasn't. From what I understand. It wasn't. No, it wasn't. It there were many hard. times when it wasn't played. And, and the funny the thing of it is that my antagonism towards Lionel didn't come from anything he did to me. Uh, personally, it was things that, that they did to other people that, that you were witness to, you know, and, and, yeah. and it was, uh, for instance, the bass player, Vernon Alley, a very fine bass player, he became ill and we were someplace in Texas and uh, the doctor said he has uh, the, the flu or something and he has to stay in bed for at least a week. And so it was like, okay, they gave him the money that he had earned. We had played like maybe four days of that week, so they gave him his salary for the four days and a ticket back, to, nothing extra, and a ticket back to California so he could, a one-way ticket so he could go back home after he recuperated, and they just hired another bass player. And it was like, okay, you're sick, goodbye, you know. Mm. And things like that, it, yeah. it, it used to really get to me. And yeah. I, I thought it was so mean, and uh, that's one of the milder things that yeah. happened, you know. Were you aspiring to, a, to play in a classical situation? At that time, also. Well, uh, yes, I did, and, and even when I was while I was with the band, I always practiced a lot of uh, classical things, mm -hmm. and, and not not thinking that I would ever get an opportunity to play in a, in a symphony orchestra, but I just did it because I, of my interest in that. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, I heard uh, Del Stegers, who he's one of, them, and, again, and I'm sure I heard Herbert Clark and something, and uh, Walter Smith, people like that who were very famous cornet soloists. But I, re I remember Del Stegers for some reason or other, or other better than most than the others, and uh, and I always I wanted to play like Del Stegers. He could double tongue and triple tongue and all this. And and uh, so after all that, Dick Perry, who was the first trumpet player with with um, Lorelei, he he was a he yeah he was playing first trumpet with them. That's how it was. And he knew I had mentioned him several times that I liked Del Stegers. So one day he said. He said, you know, I have, a, I have a, a two, two albums, two recordings of Del Stegers. And he said, they're in a double album thing. And he said, one day I'll bring it in and, and you can take it home and you can put it on a cassette and, and record it and, and mm -hmm. then bring them back to me. So I said, okay. And he did that. He brought them in. And I, so I took it home and it's Del Stegers and he's had a very high pitched voice. And now when you play this, you do ton, 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 ton. He had a voice like that, but his playing was really beautiful. Yeah. And of course the recording wasn't that great because of the time at which it was done. But, so I thought to myself, now what can I do to put Dick Perry on when, when I go back with these recordings? And I had one of these big, LPs on the rubber about that thick, those old recordings, mm -hmm. it was of no use. And I took this thing and threw it on the floor, and it ended up in about 50 small pieces, you know. And I put these in this envelope with his recording, 
the two recordings. So when I came into the theater, I was coming in, I saw him and some of the other guys, like nudge, one of the fellows coming in, I said, watch this. And I pretended I stumbled on the <laughs> stairs, and as I did, I turned this envelope, and these pieces are falling out of the envelope on the floor. See? And I said, oh my God, I told oh, Dick, I'm so sorry. I said, I just dropped the, the, the records, and, and, and I said, look at this. And, the piece, and he's sitting there, and he's like almost pale. He said, well, he looked at me funny. He said, well, you, you did put it on cassette, didn't you? I said, yeah, I did record it. And then I started laughing. <laughs> I started smiling. He looked at me. He said, you know what? He said, I know what it is. So you're up to one of your dirty tricks. <laughs> Oh, man. I mean, you could have seen the expression on his face when this envelope, this manila envelope, turned up these pieces falling all over. Yeah, I've learned that you're quite, quite a practical joker. I, I <laughs> Bob Rosengarden was saying that we called them wilderisms <laughs> yeah. that you used to do on the Dick Cavett band. Oh, yeah. I was always, I, I you know, the, the pages would ask the audience to write uh, questions or some comment, make a comment about something. So, so they, they said, why don't you write something? So I wrote a, I t I wrote a thing that I, I had been doing research on the Salem witch trials and that I discovered that during that period there were two sisters who, who were also burned at the stake and uh, the, the, uh, the, the Kendall sisters. Mm -hmm. and, and one was Mary and the other one was Susan Kendall. And it just turns out by coincidence that, that Mary Kendall was the first woman burned at the stake and, the, and Susan was the last one. And I said, that's where we got the expression burning the Kendalls at both ends. You know? and Cab Cab Dick Cabot was looking at this and he got just almost to that point and said, I know where this is going. Who did this? The guy started pointing. <laughs> Well, I wish we had a drum to go to the boom. You know. Yeah, boom. <laughs> I hear you also got a little baseball in in your career. Oh yeah, you were with a show band, a pit I, band. I, you know, when all the theaters, uh, there was a fellow named John Efrat, and he conceived the idea of starting a Broadway softball league, and all the theaters would have a ball team, and they would compete with each other. And this meant that anybody in the cast or the stagehands could be a member of the team, which produced some pretty shabby ball teams. Uh -huh. <laughs> there were some that were very good, but uh, most of them were pretty <laughs> low-keyed. And uh, I, I was with, I was with um, Silk Stockings, the um, Cole Porter show, and we had a team. We won the championship that year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I, I played ball when I was a kid. We played ball. We had a, a neighborhood ball team. And my dad and my two, uh, my two uncles, my father's two brothers, were very good ball players and played baseball. So uh, I had started out a long time ago playing ball, and I enjoyed it. And uh, we had a lot of fun out there. It was fun. What's your position of choice? I played shortstop or third base. Uh -huh. yeah. I was never a long ball hitter, but I could place hit pretty well. Yeah. And, and when we won the uh, championship, Mel Allen came and gave us, we got trophies for different things that we had done. You know? All right. It was really nice. How's the work um, scene changed for you, like in the last 10 years? Do you um, pick and choose a little more than usual? I, I think you're almost right on that. I think I, I'm picked and chosen. <laughs> <laughs> on occasion, okay. I, I, it, it is, it's, I, I sometimes I, I have the, uh, the the privilege of deciding what I what what I want to do, and I'm. But the offers are not that numerous now. And, and you know, and the other thing is that I'm much older, mm -hmm. and uh, I started out as a young player, and some of the older fellows were were moved out to make room for me, and so it's the same thing now. You know, and it's something you have to accept, and and understand because as you get older, there are a lot of things that. I find playing with the uh, Smithsonian Orchestra, uh, I do them, but I don't do them with the ease that I did when I was younger. I mean, I, I mm -hmm. have to really, it calls for a lot more concentration and, and a lot more practice. So I, I accept that, you know. And, and, yeah. But I still can't complain because I still get a, a lot of nice things, and most of them, with regards to picking and choosing, I do decide if, if I'm not going to enjoy doing it, I won't do it because I'm too old to be hassled by what I have to do. I wanted to play a piece um, and talk about improvising, mm -hmm. if we could. This, um, 
no greater love. Mm -hmm. First of all, it sounds like two, two trumpet players. That's exactly there. what I had in mind, too. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a put on, but you know, you're kidding with yourself. Yeah. There's two different yeah. guys, you know. That was a kind of mute, was there. It's a plunger. Yeah. It's a toilet plunger, yeah. and it has a hole in the end. It has a hole in it, so if you push it tight against the bell, it sounds like a harmon mute. That's why you hear the, the, the yeah. lighter sound. It sounds almost like a harmon mute. Uh -huh. so that's why I could get away with that. <laughs> this is. Uh, actually, a hard question to to ask and answer because improvising is something that is rather hard to define. Mm -hmm. But actually, a student yesterday was asking I think the same question and about your thought process when you're improvising. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to to verbalize what you think about on any particular tune while you're playing? No, <clears throat> I don't know. These, these things come to you automatically. I mean, uh, sometimes, usually if I'm going to play something while someone else is playing, I'll try to think of something that I would like to start, introduce my solo with, uh, something that's relative to the, to the, quali the, the nature of the piece itself, mm -hmm. and, and uh, something that fits kind of harmonically with what's going on. And I usually try to think about that. And, and I also think it's, it's just uh, imp improvisation is, it's like, giving a speech or, or something like that, you have a subject and your interpretation of it may differ from mine, but it's still basically the same subject. So that's the theme that you're, you're, you're improvising around. And you, and you try to play something that enhances it uh, and, and also adds a little, a, a little different flavor to it. So you don't come in and play exactly what the person before you. Even, you may even extract some of what he played as a lead-in to what you're going to do, you know, and, and so you get that dovetailing. It's like passing the baton in a relay race. You do it smoothly, you know, you don't do this, you're running and you pick up the same speed uh, as that person wh whom you're, you're going to accept the baton for or pass it to, and you get that smooth transition, you know. Yeah. That's, that's, if you listen to a lot of uh, improvisation in, in different groups, you, when they have a, that smooth transference from one to the other, that's the way it does, that's the way it comes off. Yeah. I like that analogy. If you took um, any particular standard that, that you feel comfortable playing with, do you have those sequence of chords memorized in your head? Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. But not always. Not always. But you can still negotiate your way through that. Right, them. right. There's some pieces that, that are a little difficult to come up with something when you're improvising, it's kind of hard to, to think of something that, that, that works pretty well. So sometimes you'll have something in your head that you knew worked once before, and you use that as a, as a platform to start mm -hmm. off from, you know. Uh, I was just trying to think of something. I'll, I'll think of some tune that, uh, in particular. Well, I noticed just, just before I turned this tape off, mm -hmm. that when you got to the bridge of the song, you started playing ba ba da 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 until, until maybe you thought of something else to right, do. Right. I mean, that's an assumption on my part. Right, But right. there's nothing wrong with playing a bit of the melody no, not here at and all. there in your <laughs> improvising. <laughs> so, so at least we know where we're coming from with it. I usually pretend my saxophone's broken if I can't think of anything to play. Uh -huh, that that uh -huh. sometimes works. <laughs> um, I had... Uh, made a little note about something I read, and, and I wonder if it actually happened. This, this came out of one of those anecdote books. You were familiar with a fellow named John Frosk? Yo, Johnny Frosk. Yeah. And there was some incident. Uh, Glenn Osser was conducting mm -hmm. something with, uh, for Sid Charisse or something, and, right. and apparently the, he called In the Mood. Oh, yeah. Was, was this a true... Did this about really Johnny happen? Frost? Yeah. Absolutely. And his trumpet solo. Can, can you tell me we, how we that happened? We were doing uh, Jukebox Saturday Night. It was a, a series they had on Channel 13. And, and when the trumpet solo came up, Johnny Frost stood up and played 
in the mood or something. He played, the solo he played was note for note from some other piece. It had nothing to do with this harmonically or otherwise. And he just played it. And everyone, but poor Abe Hansel was standing there looking. He couldn't believe that this was happening. <laughs> Him with a straight face, he played this was unbelievable. Was it was it a string of pearls or something? That's what it was. Because That's I know what that it was. they're both the same length. Yeah. You know, <laughs> That's so funny. You have to know Johnny yeah. Frost to, to know. Yes. Wow. He's a wonderful first trumpet player, by uh -huh. the way. <laughs> um, can, now, here's another hard question: Can you recall some of the most difficult playing situations you've been in? From a just from a trumpet standpoint, and and did you I, get I them guess, through them successfully yeah, in your uh, on a couple of times when uh, I played with the Philharmonic, and uh, it wasn't difficult, but I I found it to be a little stressful because here you're, you're somebody who's not really generally playing in that idiom, and uh, and now you're in the middle of it, and and you've got to participate, you got to perform like everybody else, and I I found that. A little tensing, but mm -hmm. uh, it's rewarding, of course, to, to do it. And I was very flattered because uh, how often does anybody who's supposed to be a commercial or a jazz player get an opportunity to do something like that? Mm -hmm. You know, and it was totally non related to the other things that I'd been accustomed to doing. But then uh, there have been some other situations. I did the uh, Haydn Trumpet Concerto a few times with, with the Municipal Concerts Orchestra in New York. And when you're, when you're doing that, I did it with the ABC Symphony once. And when you're doing some of those things, of course, you, you can't help but feel a little tension. But it, again, it's challenging. And, uh, and when, once having done it, it's very rewarding. You know. it, the definition of a mistake is much clearer <laughs> in that music. Right. You know. right. I mean, I noticed a, a few times in this, the, the fall coming concert we just, we just heard, which was great, that... There was a few times that I think the soloists may have gone in a direction that they didn't really intend. Right. But you're able to. You're able to get around it. Get around it. Right. And get out of it, right. and it sounded like you meant right. to do it, right. whether or not you right. did. That's when that's when your <laughs> your faculties come into focus, and you begin trying to you, you create something that you didn't intend to create, mm -hmm. and it comes off very often. Now you you got um, bachelor's from the Manhattan, Manhattan School, School of Music. Of music yeah. Did um, the process of learning how to function in, in a combo, for instance, the jazz etiquette and so forth, did you get any of that there, or did you, how do you learn that? You mean uh, in the, going from the jazz to the classical? Yes. Or? I mean, how did you learn to play in a small combo? Was it, was it simply by doing it? Basically, that's what it was, yeah. In Philadelphia, I played with um, a small group, Lonnie Slappy's band, and there was a trumpet player, Frank Galbraith, who was really an exception. He had a different style from almost anybody else that I had heard, and he sort of established the style of this group, but the, the, it was predicated more or less on the, the John Kirby band because the, the makeup of the band was basically the same, but it was a different style band, and uh, I took his place and I was still in school at that time. So I, from listening to him and the things he did, I began trying to do some things of mine that, I, that were not necessarily anywhere near what the kinds of things he did, but I would get an opportunity to experiment. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and some things worked, and those things I retained, and the others let go, but it was a chance for me to, to practice all the time and get that experience. And playing, it's, it's a little different playing in a small group. It's like playing in brass quintets, and chamber orchestras, you know, you're, you're, there's more exposed playing, calls for a little more technique very often because you can, you're not buried in a section with uh, an orchestra of 60 or 70 people or something like that. And everything you do, someone can focus on. So you, you develop a, 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 a little more technique and, and more daring. <laughs> uh -huh. Is it harder for the trumpet player to play in quintets and sextet because uh, the trumpet man usually is responsible for the melody. They are, yeah. But everyone is, is sort of, th this is where you're more or less, everyone is treated equally by the composers and the music you're playing mm -hmm. because in, in quintets, uh, regardless of what chair you're playing, 
your chair is very important. And at some point, you're playing solo. You're playing solo parts. So it's, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and you develop a sense of relationship musically to the, to the other players you're playing with and in the group. How's the actual business? Uh, it seems that there's too many stories about business people taking advantage of musicians mm -hmm. over the years. Yeah. Have you experienced that and has it, has it changed? Well, I think it's changed and uh, for instance, as in the case of the jazz party you have here at Hamilton, with, uh, with especially with people like Milt Phileas. I mean, these, these are men who are proud of who they are mm -hmm. and uh, they want people who work for them to feel proud of having been associated with them. I'm using him as an example. There are a few others who, there aren't many, mm -hmm. but there are some others who, who think likewise and they treat the musicians very well with a great deal of respect and of course they expect the same in return, but uh, they're the, the exceptions. There are a lot of people who still think, uh, for instance, I, had a, I was called to do an, a, a recording with Maxine Sullivan, which turned out to be her last recording, and I would gladly have done it for nothing, basically. But the fellow who called me, when he called me and said that uh, she had asked if I could do the recording with her, and I said, I'd be flattered to do it. And I said, by the way, what are you, how much are you paying? And he said, uh, hey, Joe, we pay sidemen scale. And I, I won't mention his name. I said, yeah. well, you've got it. Boom. And I just hung up on yeah. it. Now, uh, these are guys who still think it's the 20s and the 30s and musicians uh, struggling, as they did in, during that period, would accept almost anything, and you, whatever you offer them, you know. And, uh, and you dictate the terms, not they, you know. Mm -hmm. well, especially the attitude, too. Yeah, you, know, you had a lot of that. And, yeah. and people, you would, you'd go work in clubs and things. Uh, and they would give you, they would pay the guys a pittance. They were making good money, but they wouldn't give it to them. Well, Lionel Hampton was a good case in point. Mm -hmm. uh, I joined that band. I was making $11 a night, mm -hmm. and I was playing, at that time, the first trumpet player. I wasn't playing the high things. He had guys there, Ernie Royal, and guys who did that. But uh, I was supposed to be the first trumpet player, and I was getting $11 a night. And I asked him at one point when I discovered that the other guys, some of them were getting 15 I thought, well, why can't I get 15 too? And I asked him about it. He said, well, you better speak to Gladys, his wife. And uh, he said, well, she takes care of that. So I spoke to her and she said, yes, what is it, uh, young man? And I said, well, I'd like to get $15 a night like everybody else. She said, well, honey, you better talk to, Mr. you talk to Joe Glazer, who was the manager. Oh boy. And uh, so I called his office and made an appointment to see him. And a couple of days hence, I went to his office at the time two o'clock, like he said. And when I walked in, he said, uh, his secretary said, who are you? And I said, well, my name is Joe Wilder. And uh, Mrs. Hampton told me to come and see Mr. Glazer. And I made an appointment for two o'clock. And she said, okay. And she called him on the intercom. And he said, okay, send him in. And when I went in, he said, uh, what do you want? And I said, well, Mrs. Hampton told me to come and speak to you about getting a, a raise. He said, hey, <laughs> you excuse the language. He said, who in the hell do you think you are? This is what this is exactly the the way he 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 asked me, and I said I looked at him. And said, Who in the hell do you think you are? And and I turned around and walked out. And I went that night. I told Lionel. I said, if I don't get fifteen dollars a night from tonight on, I'm out. You have to get somebody else. And uh, so he said, well, well, I'll, I'll talk to Gladys about it. And so he spoke to her. And as of the next night, they did pay me fifteen dollars a night. But uh, that was the attitude towards the musicians and. And, and unfortunately, in some places, it still prevails. And probably some other musicians would have not pursued it like you did. No, I, they they, well, they might have been intimidated by yes. it. You know, I, yeah. not that I wasn't too. I mean, to some extent, I was. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm a young kid. I don't think. Yeah. But that's the way it went. Mm. You had to, if you were on the road for eleven dollars a night, you had to buy your own meals yeah. out of that. And it wasn't, it, you could get by on that, but uh -huh. you're also paying your room, your room rent out of that, you know. And uh, it, it was just, it was, like, it was almost like, in a sense, I guess he could say it was like slave labor, you know, mm -hmm. slave wages. And, yeah. and they were making a fortune. I mean, really making a fortune. You couldn't get into the halls where they were playing. They were so popular. It was a good band, you know, young band. Uh, it, well, that's, well, as I say, yeah. that's the way it went. Yeah. 
I guess it makes you appreciate to, to pay those kind of dues makes the good times that much better. That's I true, suppose. too. It does. And it also makes you aware of being treating other people fairly yourself. I mean, and, and if you ever find yourself in that position, the first thing I think about is treating the other guys the same way. I've, I've uh, done recordings and things like that, or I've done, so I did something for Schaefer Beer, <clears throat> um, well, I guess a couple of years ago, and uh, I was the leader of this particular group. And so rather than take, they, they said, well, we'll pay you a certain amount of money. This was through the Peter Duchin office, and I accepted it, and I said, okay. And it was just a quartet. And so I just took the money and just split it up, and we all got the same thing. You know, I just said, well, it's, you know, it's no big deal. We just all get the same thing. But that's the way I tried to do it, and it's the way I feel about it, but it comes from the treatment that I got as a, as a young musician. You know? Yeah. It's a good lesson. <laughs> I, I remember you talking a little bit about some fellows who would try to cut corners and, and play the game of of booking two sessions at the same time, oh, yeah. too, and, and that kind of... Yeah. These were guys who were counting every penny they could get. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, someone would call you for a, a jingle date, a commercial, television commercial or something, and they would say, well, can you do a date from 10 to 12? And the guy would say yes, and then someone else would call, maybe shortly thereafter, and say, hey, and this, this date would be in the next week. And someone else would call and say, hey, I've got a, I've got a date that goes from, uh, from 12 o'clock to 3 or something like that. Can you make it? Now, he's got a date from 10 to 12, and, it's, and he's like 15 blocks away from the other studio. There's no way he's going to get to the other mm -hmm. date on time. And so the guy would say yes to the fellow. Instead of saying, well, I, I won't be able to make it because I'm already busy, say yes to the guy that has the 12 to 3 date and show up on his date at maybe a quarter to 1, and say, geez, you know, I didn't know that yeah. the other date was going to go over time or something. Not have, having not called him to warn him of it or anything, just to, to make the money, you know, rather mm -hmm. than say, let somebody else make it. There's, there's enough for all of us, and there was at that time, yeah. a lot. Sometimes we did three or four jingle dates on the same day. Wow. And uh, it got to the point where, in my case, I wouldn't accept more than three. Now, this doesn't mean that... Uh, we were, you know, it was like a land office business or anything, but I wouldn't accept more than three because sometimes you'd go on one, it would be so easy to do that you felt like you were robbing them. And, and then by the time you got to the fourth one, it would be something so hard that you wish you hadn't started playing the instrument, you know, <laughs> that much of a difference. So I knew that I could handle three uh -huh. in one day, but four. You know. Was there certain arrangers whose names that you like to see Oh, yeah. On the chart, and yeah. certain this you didn't. Uh, Neil Hefty was one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Neil Hefty. Now, because you asked me that, I can't think of some. But there were several guys who you just you just broke your neck getting to the studio to work for them because mm -hmm. it was always always a joy. Uh, Billy Byers, guys like that. Uh, Ken Hopkins. These guys could write, and, 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 and Buddy Weed was another one. Glenn Osser, who was a conductor of the Miss America pageant. Like, when we did the Miss America pageant, it was always a joy because he wrote such beautiful arrangements. Everything was just perfect, you know? And, and you got such a big kick yeah. out of playing that music. Wow. Yeah, there was, and Neil Hefty was a guy. Anytime I got a call and it said, it's for Neil, <laughs> that's it. I'll be there. <laughs> wow. What do you think of the state of music this, these days? Is uh, that for an open question? <laughs> no, not really. It, it's, it's strange, and there are, there are a lot of things. But of course, the, the younger musicians have different ideas about what, how the music should be played and the kind of music. And, and uh, I don't condemn them for it. I mean, I, I guess because of the era in which I grew up, I don't relate to it too well. But I remember a time when I thought the Beatles were terrible when they first, I thought it was the worst, some of the worst garbage I'd ever heard. But as I began hearing more and more of it, I, I began to acquire great respect for what they were doing. And, and a lot of what they did was tremendous and has influenced a lot of the things that we do today and that are acceptable, you know. So I won't put down any of the uh, young people with the young guys with the rock or the, the uh, what do they call it? Third stream and, and uh, 
fusion. Fusion and, yeah. and those things. I mean, that's, that's just another aspect of music. And, and I'm sure that as time goes on, there'll be other developments that mm -hmm. come along. But from those, uh, there'll be a, a lot of well-established styles that'll be accepted. Mm -hmm. Do you recall if your parents listened to the music that you liked and how did they feel about it? Did they feel that? I, uh, that's, my father, being a musician, is the one that pointed me, I guess, in the right mm -hmm. direction. And my mother, too, for that matter. But my father used to listen to, we, we had the radio, and that's all you had. And you listened to, there were bands, that some of which people w won't even wonder where I'm coming from with this. But there were bands like Gus Arnheim, uh, Paul Whiteman, of course, and, and Duke Ellington was one of my father's favorites. And it was Cab Calloway and Fletcher Henderson and all these different bands. And then we used to listen to, uh, what's, the, what's the, uh, Horace Height and those bands. And we listened to every band because they were playing all the time. Anytime you turn on the radio, day or night, you could hear some of these orchestras. And my father listened to them intently. And so I came up listening to all these things and learned, and, and without having someone point it out to me, I just acquired an appreciation for all the different styles that I heard. And, and my father was even a, a fan of, of the uh, 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 Wayne King oh. and, and uh, Guy Lombardo. Yeah, he even liked the, I mean, the syrupy he, he stuff. He liked yeah. all these, and so yeah. and through him, I learned to, to appreciate all of these bands. Mm -hmm. And you could identify them because their styles were so different. He must be, uh, look at your career and be pretty happy. I would uh, yeah, I, I am. I, I've been one of the most fortunate musicians, I guess, in the, in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, most of the things I did, I did with people I enjoy doing them with. Most of the music I was involved with, I, I got great enjoyment out of. And I'm still doing I still do. I mean, it's like the guys who were here with the other night. I yeah. mean, how can you go someplace and, and as, a, as an employee and have that much fun? <laughs> <laughs> It's un unreal. Right. Where's the state of, um, I'm not sure how to ask this question, but over the years, has the business, the way the business has been set up, uh, provide you with some kind of retirement for 20 years from now when you stop playing? Uh, well, I have, I got a pension from the uh, Federation, the American Federation of Musicians. And having worked in the theater and, and uh, done those, those jobs from which money was extracted for your pension, uh -huh. uh, I'm in pretty good shape. Uh, unfortunately, when you look back and you look at Duke Ellington's band, Woody Herman's band, yeah. uh, most, most Count Basie's band, those fellows had absolutely nothing going into a pension fund. They had nothing going in there. So that when they, when they finished playing, it was like if they hadn't saved any money on their own, that was it. When, when the earning thing stopped, that was the end of their uh, ability to earn money. I mean, it, there was nothing left. And, the, and the, of course, when you're on the road with a band, and especially when you're younger, you, we all have the idea that this goes on forever. I mean, you never look into the future. You don't think that way. You, you have no reason to, you know. But uh, from, I, I'm, I'm one of the fortunate guys, mm -hmm. really. Have you seen uh, or heard anything about the swing revival that supposedly is happening these days? The, 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 revival. the swing revival. Oh, I think that's coming about. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people, are, because when I would play some of the jazz parties and you'd go there, you'd see people who were in my age group and some a little younger. But now, when uh, with the Smithsonian Orchestra, for instance, and the, the uh, Lincoln Center Jazz Orchestra and the Carnegie Hall Band, when they go out, a lot of young people are coming. Of course, they're coming, a lot of them, because there are young people in those bands. But at the same time, the music they're listening to is the music from the swing era. Mm -hmm. and, and they're being educated in that, in that regard. And, and you, you're developing a following, a new following of that, because there's been a whole, been a hiatus of, from, of, uh, from jazz uh, of, the, of the swing era for a long time, mainly because people don't go to, the, to ballrooms anymore. Yeah. Uh, what they hear, I guess mostly they hear on television and things like that, but now they're coming out. It's a good sign. Yeah. Did you have occasion to play the Savoy? The Savoy know, Ballroom, oh yeah. I played the Savoy Ballroom with Lucky Millinder. I played in there with uh, Jimmy Lunsford's band. I played, I subbed in there a few times with Erskine Hawkins' band. Uh, Jimmy Rushing had a band. I played with them oh. a few times. 
I, I played a lot in the Savoy Ballroom. That was, that was quite a place. I, I was just place. Can, I wish I could have been there. It sounds yeah. like a, a, a great yeah. scene. Yeah, that was, that was something. That was something. Uh, there were certain temples that, that would get people, people going. They wanted to dance to certain t temples. And Lucky Milliner was one of the guys that knew exactly what temples and certain pieces that the people would like to dance to. And he'd get these things like they do the, the hucklebuck. And that's how And you look out there, people would be getting up out of their seats and going out on the dance floor. And, and the floor had a certain spring to it. And when it, would, when it would be full, you could just see the floor floating up just a little bit. They, I don't know if they had some coasters or something on it, but to, to keep the vibration to, to carry the vibration of this continual dancing and everything it was something to see i mean just wow. a sea of people just all of them you know <laughs> funny scenes out there it has a positive effect on the music doesn't yeah. it I mean, yeah you, it, you was the music. That it was the music they had the savoy sultans that was a little group and they used to play in there and, and big bands would come in and the big bands would be good, but the Savoy Sultans knew the tempos that got everybody's hearts started. Yeah. And the other, sometimes a big band would be in there and he would almost die. And the Sultans would come in and just tear up the house, you know, because of the tempos they played in. Who was in the original Sultans? The, the Savoy Sultans? Yeah. Uh, Can you recall? I'm trying to remember. I know I, Panama Francis did name, it years later. Yeah, I, no, I can't remember. What was his name? Because the leader's name, it was like so-and-so and the Savoy yeah. Sultans. I can't remember his name. Well, we'll get out the history book later yeah, and, yeah. And, and check it out. Yeah. What do you have coming up in the, the future? Well, the, the, the Smithsonian has a, a big tour coming up in January. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, when I, when I go back now, I, I may have a couple things, but I, I'm going to really take it easy because I'm still having a lot of dental work done. Mm -hmm. And this will give me a chance to take care of it and, and give me a chance to recuperate from it. So for probably from now until the, the beginning of January, I won't do much, mm -hmm. if anything at all. Who do you hear young jazz trumpeters these days that appeal to you? I think most of them do. Yeah. I mean, I, and unfortunately, I can't remember all their names off the top of my head, but, the, but these guys, uh, the, some of them, they're so talented. And, and they can do many things. They, they, you know, they play jazz, they can play classical, and, uh, and, and, and they've got range and ideas and technique. It's just phenomenal. But they've had, you know, they've had training at an earlier age than most of us did, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and they're able to apply it. They're good players. Is there one band or orchestra or circumstance that you missed that you could go back to if you could turn back the clock? I guess, uh, well, you know, I love Basie's band. Basie's band was, a count, count was so relaxed and so nice. He was a nice man. And, and the band was such a swinging band. I didn't stay with them long. I wasn't with them very long, but I enjoyed all, all the time that I was with them. And Jimmy Lunsford's band, well, I, I was so sorry that he passed away because the band was coming back and uh, the guys he had in the band were good players, and it was reaching a point where the band was really beginning to develop on the same level as the original band, which was very nice. But uh, Jimmy died, and that was the end of that. You know? Yeah. But the, and Sam Donahue certainly had a good band. He had a good band. I played most of the bands that I played with were enjoyable to play with, and and uh, I just more or less went from one thing to the other as a matter of security because when I when I left the, the, the uh, road and started working in New York, I did, started doing Broadway shows. But I, didn't, I first went to the Diamond Horseshoe with, no, with Noble Sissel. I was working in, no, in the Diamond Horseshoe with Noble Sissel when I got called to do a show called Alive and Kicking. That was the first Broadway show I did. And that was with Carl Reiner, um, Jack Guilford, and uh, I forget the other, there was another comedian who was very well known. Mm -hmm. And those guys, they were in the show. Carl Reiner was writing for the show and everything. And it lasted seven weeks. And while I was doing, while I was in the Diamond Horse Show, when I got called, I had to ask uh, Noble Sissel if I could 
get out to go do this because they had to give you were required to give two weeks notice to the uh, employer you were working for mm -hmm. and and they they were getting the show together in less than the two weeks oh. so i asked him and he said well you know there are no black musicians playing in the broadway theaters and maybe this will be a nice chance to to, to get started so he said okay young man you can you can go he said but you can if you, you i'll give you five weeks or something like that and after that, I had to get somebody to take, to replace you. So I thought that was fair. And the show closed after seven, but he still let me come back. And shortly thereafter, I got another call to do a, another show that turned out to be Guys and Dolls. And so he said, well, now, you know, I'm going to do the same thing. After five weeks, if you're not back, I have to get someone else. And that show went three years. <laughs> so I was lucky. But it was thanks to him that I got the chance to do it. That first show you did, that must have been like a, quite a switch. It was. It was, a, it, was a it was a review, too, by the way. It, was a, it wasn't a, a show with a, a format like uh, Guys and Dolls oh. or something like that. And they kept changing the, the material every day. They would change. It went seven weeks, but for seven weeks of complete changing all the time. And it never did it, it melt together uh -huh. too well. That's why it failed. But, uh, <laughs> It was, it was an interesting experience, really. Wow, and then you did one show for three years. You know, Guys and Dolls. Uh -huh. yeah. How many and that was considered a long run, three years. Yeah. And then when we got around, I did uh, Silk Stockings and Most Happy Fella. And then and during Most Happy Fella, before that was over, I went on staff at ABC. Because, mm -hmm. But uh, those are good shows, good shows. Wow. Oh. Well, been fascinating talking to you again. Well, you, you certainly put me at ease. <laughs> Anything that uh, that I haven't asked you that uh, you'd uh, like to? I think we've covered quite a bit. Well, yeah. When we when we get off, we'll probably think of a hundred other right, things that's that true. might have touched on. But I do think that you should go home and listen to some of your own recordings. I guess you've got a point. There. I have some of them like like this. They're still in the cellophane. You know, <laughs> I never take. <laughs> And people, in fact, uh, what, what recording was it? Uh, oh, I did a classical album. And Alec Wilder wrote a sonata for me. He, used to, he had, a, had a knack of writing concerti and sonatas and things for his friends, you know. And he really put you to the test. So I recorded a thing, and, and I had forgotten who had written the liner notes, mainly because I just glanced at them when the album came out. And it was... Uh, Jim Marr had written the, the, the liner notes, and we were over at Prince at the uh, Rutgers University, and we were on the way home, and he was talking about this album because they had played some excerpts of it. Uh, Ed Berger had played yeah. some of it. And he was saying, yeah, you know, such and such a thing about it. And he said, when I wrote the liner notes, I was embarrassed. I, I looked, and when I got home, I looked. I didn't even realize it was Jim Marr who had written the liner yeah. notes. I mean, I didn't tell him that, that, that you hadn't even read it. It was unbelievable. But it was because I hadn't played the album. I didn't yeah. listen to it. I think most musicians, when they, they listen to their own work, you, they you, probably We say, listen to it in the studio when, it's, you know, when we're doing the final thing, sometimes uh, uh -huh. before it's even been mastered. And you listen to it. And usually, in my case, I, I, I'll hear something that I'd say, well, that, that wasn't really right. And I wish I hadn't done this that way or something like that. Not that I, this would have been any better or, or worse, but you listen, and I'm very critical about that. I mean, I hear things that I know that could have been done better, and that disturbs me, so I don't bother <laughs> to listen to it. Well, I like them. Yeah. <laughs>